Welcome back, everybody. Uh, Randy, I hear you're ready to go. We're excited uh, to hear what you have to say, and uh, we're very honored that uh, you're be able to present with us today. And um, you know, the CEO of Prevail, trusted partner of uh, uh, H2L Solutions. So, with Rain, Randy, we'll go ahead and I'll give you the floor, and we'd love to hear what you have to say, sir. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks for the opportunity. Really appreciate it. Sorry, not there with everybody in person. COVID is doing strange things to all of us here. Um, let me share my screen. Um, so my topic today is securing uh, controlled and classified information in the supply chain, looking from big primes to small uh, independent suppliers and everything in between. Um, I think, you know, enough has been said about the concern, the problem that we're all trying to solve here. Um, as Ms. Ellen Lord, you know, says, uh, the real concern for the DOD is that it's so much more appealing to attack the, the subcontractors way down the line than going after the prime. So, uh, so we're here to, you know, talk about how to, how to help address that. And I thought it'd be fun to, uh, to address this issue from three different perspectives. Um, they're all uh, customers of ours. One kind of perspective is a very large prime, you know, billions of revenue, thousands of employees, mostly defense business, thousands of suppliers. And their, their primary concern is, of course, security, but really security of their supply base. I mean, they, they have tons of resources. Uh, they have fairly locked down IT environments. But, you know, some of these guys have been fined tens of millions of dollars because some of their designs have leaked through their supply base. And uh, they're launching initiatives to, to interact, you know, more securely with their suppliers and help their suppliers become more compliant. Another perspective is a medium-sized company. And what I'm thinking about now is, you know, a couple hundred million in revenue, hundreds of employees. But uh, what's interesting about them is only about 20% of their business is defense. So they have to manage an, an IT environment that, you know, serves mostly their commercial businesses, but they also, you know, don't want to kill their defense business. They want to be compliant. And they too want to secure communications with their supply base, which may only be hundreds of suppliers instead of thousands, but still, you know, uh, an important topic for them. And a third perspective is a very small engineering consultancy, less than 10 employees, mostly defense business. Uh, for them, being on the leading edge of compliance is an opportunity to show their customers that, you know, they have a competitive advantage. They're going to take information security very, very seriously. And they want to actually, even though they're small, they want to kind of be first up in, uh, in, in being compliant and managing security, what they're doing so that they have an edge over their competitors in dealing with their customers. So we'll take a look at all of them and their unique perspectives and their unique needs. But um, all of them share some, some issues that, that are keeping them up at night. Compliance, of course. Um, and then more than compliance, sleeping at night you know of course there's no panacea that that gets you 100 percent secure but but they also don't just want to check the boxes in compliance they want to know that the information security of their systems will 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 go above and beyond in, in protecting them and so they can sleep better now they got to do this without screwing up the productivity of their employees because you know, adding more and more systems and more and more complexity so that folks in the organization cannot get their work done, that's a non-starter. That'll never work in the organization. So always this balance between good security and productivity. And of course, costs are a big, big, big deal. Um, a lot of what I'm focusing on is, is, is involving controlled, unclassified information, which, um, you know, those of you in the CMMC world know that this is level three and above. And uh, there's a big push on securing CUI because um, it is, you know, information that needs to be secured, but often it's the path of least resistance for adversaries because in some cases you can have weaker systems, uh, you know, that are, that are managing CUI and so the bad guys can go after CUI first. 
So let's look at each of these topics in a little bit more detail. Compliance, uh, everybody here has been talking about CMMC. As you know, it's a unified standard. It's five levels of security based on the sensitivity of information involved. I'm focusing here on level three and above for CUI. And, uh, and eventually anybody that's gonna be in the supply chain for winning a contract from the DOD is gonna have to be certified and audited. That, as we all know, is, is just, just uh, starting to happen now. And as you may know, CMMC defines these uh, 17 different domains, 120 some odd controls in these main categories. Um, systems can help with a lot of them, but not all of them. I mean, we're, we're a, you know, a software supplier, and so we try and do as much as possible in the systems that we provide to carry a lot of the, the heavy lifting, the burden in addressing a lot of these controls. Uh, even the ones that are green here, they're not 100% system solve the problems. Sometimes you need policies and processes and, you know, internal controls to address some of them. Um, the ones in yellow are both systems can help, and, uh, but you still need, you know, some, some work outside the systems. And the one in, ones in blue are mostly internal processes, policies that you have to document and demonstrate that, you know, you're, you're, you're living up to. Um, but there's been plenty of talk on CMMC, so I'm going to not spend as much time on the, the, the particulars of CMMC much further. I want to move on to another compliance topic, and that's ITAR. Some of you are dealing with um, information that's subject to ITAR rules. And if you have been dealing with uh, that information, you know that there's a lot of requirements on the systems that you use. For example, historically, you couldn't share ITAR-related data in a cloud service because you couldn't, you couldn't guarantee who had access to that data, and it was, in essence, considered exported. And so that just meant, you know, uh, just cloud services were off the table. And cloud services are nice because you don't have to have internal systems, they can scale easily, they're cost effective and so forth. You may or may not know that in March of this year, a new rule came out of the State Department that said that you can use cloud services provided, and there's a number of you know, uh, things that you have to be concerned with, but the, the main points are the data is encrypted end to end, uh, and that the cl cloud service provider doesn't have access to the decryption keys that get at that data. Uh, so what that means is if the cloud service can be considered just kind of a gibberish place to store, you know, uh, encrypted stuff, and the cloud service provider has no means to get at the data, you can use a cloud service uh, to share ITAR data. Um, and if you want offline, we can reference the appropriate um, regulations around that. Um, so that's, that's what I'm going to focus on from a security standpoint. I also mentioned, you know, uh, from a compliance standpoint, a lot of folks want to go beyond, you know, kind of checking the security bo boxes and trying to figure out how can I sleep better at night. And I thought I'd offer some co core principles um, for that, that better sleep. <laughs> um, a, a lot of folks in the security community talk about encryption in transit, encryption at rest. So encryption in transit means that when something is going to go, let's say, from a web browser to a server or a mail client to the server, it's encrypted throughout the, the, the internet um, as it traverses the internet. It then gets decrypted at the server. Uh, and so this is good because it means that somebody snooping over the internet is not going to be able to see your plain text. But the concern is that the information stays in plain text on the server. And an attacker attacking the server can get all the data from the organization. Think of the, the, the North Korean hack of Sony servers or, or, the, or the DNC server. Um, if you can get to the server, you can get to the data. More and more people they, these days are talking about end-to-end -end encryption, where information is encrypted on the client, it stays encrypted on the server, and never gets decrypted until it gets to its destination. And what that means is that the server is, in essence, a repository for encrypted data. And if an attacker is able to penetrate the server, all they're getting is gibberish. 
They, can, they, they might be able to attack an, an individual computer and compromise an individual user, which is never good, but you know, there are ways one can take to protect that. But that, that is not where the big breaches occur. The big breaches occur when bad guys get into the server. Another, uh, um, uh, and by the way, you know, the NSA has kind of uh, jumped on this as well. Uh, at the beginning of COVID, they had some, you know, guidelines for collaboration and teleworking. And the number one thing that they point out is does the service implement end-to-end -end encryption for the reasons we just described. Another interesting uh, principle to consider is where are the central points of attack? In other words, where are the places an adversary can go where if they can compromise that single place, they can get lots and lots of data, maybe even across the entire organization. We mentioned one, you know, just a slide ago, if the server is storing plain text and you can compromise the server, you get everything. Often not uh, thought of as well are administrators. You can think of the ad administrators as central points of an attack. Uh, if you can compromise an administrator, you know, Snowden had admin rights, then often you have the ability to export data, to change passwords, manage users, and so forth. So how to counteract that? Uh, it's really all about, about distributing the trust rather than centralizing the trust. You know, from a server standpoint, you can encrypt things. So again, you know, so that if, you're, if you were to successfully get the data, you'd have to attack every single client in the network, which is again, much harder than attacking a single server. And from an admin standpoint, you can implement policies, procedures, even cryptographic tools that I'll describe later that require several people to have to agree, kind of like the nuclear launch keys, before something really dangerous occurs, like you know, exporting data or, or deleting user accounts or things like that. Authentication. Um, you know, the basics we talk about all the time, keep the password complex, change it often, add multi-factor authentication so that you have to have something you know, i.e. the password plus something you have, let's say a phone, to go with that. And even better is to add cryptographic keys, unique, you know, really long number sequences that cannot be guessed that um, that mean that you know if you if if your access is 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 enabled by a key uh, inside a device, then a, an attacker would have to compromise that device. They would not be able to log in from another country remotely. Uh, even multi-factor authentication can sometimes be hacked uh, to enable remote ac access. But unique keys stored on a device makes that much 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 more difficult. So these are all just a, you know, a few principles that if one can incorporate them in one's you know, security plan, then, uh, then you really kind of up the game. Um, we talked about the concerns for you know, all of our different you know, kind of favorite uh, customer perspectives here. Uh, one is also productivity. Um, and often there's a balance between productivity and security. The more think secure you make things, the, the the harder it is for end users to get their stuff done. Uh, but I think there are, there are ways of achieving that balance, keeping the user experience simple, integrating with existing apps and the way people already do things. So, you know, if you're gonna share files, it'd be nice if you just dragged and dropped in your local file system to manage files. Um, you should be able to go back to, you know, whatever versions you want to get back to. At the same time, there's some, you know, a lot of security things that, that can, that can um, be applied that don't get in the way of the user experience. Uh, controls around, you know, how people can share data. The ability to rev uh, revocate those sharing rules. In other words, if I share with somebody, how do I undo that unshare from them so they no longer have access? Audit logs that track everything. Audit logs that are tamper-proof. In other words, they're encrypted so that um, you, 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 you cannot uh, uh, forge an audit entry. Controls down to the device level. If somebody loses the device, turning off their access and so forth. So now let's go beyond principles to some of these uh, case studies of these particular organizations. Let's start with our um, company that we'll call Company Big, a very large prime. And uh, as I mentioned, you know, their concern was really controlling CUI in the supply chain. 
Um, they really want to secure their interactions with their suppliers, their thousands of suppliers. And for them, the, the keys to that involved being able to have certain sharing controls as when they shared information and being able to revoke that sharing, being able to track uh, who used what when. Uh, for their internal users, they wanted to be able to control whether other devices were allowed to be added or not to the system. In some cases, it's beneficial to let your mobile device access this data, in other cases not. They wanted to be able to selectively manage that across their user base. Uh, secondarily, I, I will say secondarily, primarily they want to secure the information flow. Secondarily, they want to facilitate supplier compliance. I mean, it is up to their suppliers to be compliant, but if they can make it easier, that's great. And, and again, they, they really want it to be state-of-the-art in security and most importantly, manage costs, not only their supplier expense, but their internal costs. So the solutions uh, set that they chose to deal with this included encrypted messaging and file storage and sharing to address, you know, uh, sleeping at night and other server attacks were not going to compromise their data uh, with end-to-end -end encryption. Um, uh, worked with existing, you know, productivity apps like the Microsoft Suite, their CAD apps, no special workflow software needed to be deployed either by them or their suppliers. They work with existing productivity apps. Minimal IT overhead, which meant a cloud service meant that they didn't have to deploy additional servers, nor did they have to configure their mail and file servers and other servers they had internally to deal with this, uh, this solution. And uh, a nice benefit was their suppliers could get started with a whole bunch of features for free. Uh, and, and a lot of them could interact entirely for free, you know, without, without any additional expense uh, to share information with this big company. So that's one perspective. Another perspective I'll call company medium, which is a, a manufacturing company uh, in the Midwest, a few hundred million in revenue, as I said, but only about 50 of their couple hundred employees really touch CUI. So this was a unique problem for them. They wanted to be compliant with CMMC for their defense business, but they didn't want to mess up or, or create a lot of increased costs for their commercial lines of business, which was actually the majority of their, of, of you know, where their company's revenues came from. Uh, so, uh, and, and then secondarily, if their first goal was compliance, their, their second objective here was to actually provide a have a solution that let them control the flow of controlled and classified information with their suppliers and they just mandated they said hey if you're going to be one of our suppliers you're going to you're, you're required to use this particular solution that we're choosing and use that to um, to exchange information with us and again of course they're cost sensitive too and the solution for them involved a secure enclave in other words, they looked at alternatives, you know, that would require them to change that, say, their, all their email and file storage and sharing systems for everybody in the company. That was a huge expense, huge training exercise, huge, you know, uh, consulting exercise. And uh, they, they chose an alternative, which was the secure enclave. In other words, we're going to still use our standard productivity apps and systems, but we're going to wrap this secure enclave around the 50 people or so in our company who touch CUI. And, uh, you know, the difference in costs for compliance for that was, you know, for them, uh, one particular IT solution was about, you know, 12 to 15,000 versus close to 100,000 bucks. If they had to touch everybody, this is just for the systems, if they had to touch everybody in their whole company. Um, and, and again, you know, redo their systems and all that kind of stuff. This particular Enclave solution didn't, didn't have to touch their legacy business systems. And again, their main solution is encrypted file storage and sharing. And, and it's free for their suppliers. So since it was free for their suppliers and easy to use, they said, hey, you want to do business with us, you need to exchange information using this particular system. The, um, our third example is, um, I'll call it Company Small. It's an engineering consultancy, just a handful of folks. They're all engineers <laughs> inside the company. They want to be CMMC compliant, but they don't have any in-house, you know, dedicated IT staff. I mean, they're engineers, they can manage systems and stuff, but they didn't want any heavy lifting 
you know, in, in terms of deploying this thing. Um, and, you know, it's their customers that were mandating, you know, uh, that they become CMMC compliant to manage CUI. And again, they're a small company. They need to minimize their, their uh, cost as well. As a small, you know, bunch of uh, tech heads, they had every kind of, you know, um, client system on the planet. Small company, but some of their guys use Macs, went different ones, Windows, Android, iPhones. You know, they let everybody use whatever they wanted. And the solution that they chose was able to work with all these things, didn't make them change their CAD applications, didn't make them change their productivity, you know, Microsoft suite that they were already using. Um, they had their regular email hosted by Google. Some of them used Outlook to get at it. Some of them actually used Gmail. And this solution added encrypted messaging that could still work with those mail clients. Um, but it, it, used, it was kind of an overlay into what they were doing. So it was really minimally disrupting you know, their environment. Uh, it's cloud service, no internal systems to manage, and very low cost. Um, uh, so three different kinds of of organizations, three related but different objectives, and uh, and and three solutions. Um, you know, uh, I, I will say that all those solutions involved what our company does uh, prevail. Um, and so let me you know give you a brief overview of that, and then uh, we can wrap up and take some questions. So uh, prevail is all about end-to-end -end encrypted. Uh, messaging and file sharing. And uh, it's used uh, for all kinds of applications, but we have a special focus on the defense industrial base. And most of our customers uh, come in that segment and they use us for CMMC to handle CUI and ITAR restricted data. Uh, the green things that I showed on the slide, you know, a few slides ago, um, so to the extent that the systems can help, you know, an email and file sharing system can address a lot of the heavy lifting in CMMC, Prevail can do that. Um, it's a cloud service, so you don't have to touch your IT infrastructure. You don't have to touch your mail servers, your file s servers. And uh, it's, it's a fraction of the cost of, of other alternatives uh, like like Microsoft GCC High and very easy to use. So let me give you a little, uh, a, a little demonstration here. This is called Prevail Drive. And for those of you that you know, share photos and stuff on Dropbox, it's, it looks and feels a lot like Dropbox. So you have a area of your, you know, your file system where you have these folders that are managed by Prevail. And if you wanna put something in Prevail, you just drag and drop and it's gonna encrypt that and store that thing uh, in, in encrypted form on the server. Uh, it works on Windows, it also works on Mac. Uh, here's the same shared file that was synchronized with this uh, Mac. You can use your regular old application. So if I open up this file and wanna make a change to it, when I'm done with that change, it's gonna be synchronized to all the devices that I have, phones, computers, and anybody else who I've shared this folder with. Here's the mobile version. There's a Prevail app on your um, mobile device for iOS and Android. Uh, you can tap on it. It's got biometric authentication uh, built in. So it checks your, your uh, face ID. Uh, here's that file we put up there before with the changes made. And you, know, you can interact with it on the phone. Or if you're you know, an administrator and you wanna prevent this stuff from working on the phone, you can do that too. Um, you can manage shared files through this browser interface, just like Dropbox. You just say share, decide who you want to share with. It knows who are already members of Prevail. So it'll put up an orange stripe to show you that they're a member. You can set various permissions, read only. You can even set a permission that says uh, items in the folder can only be viewed, not downloaded. And there's a browser viewer so you can view things. And when you have view only permissions, you can actually track every time somebody you shared with actually viewed the folder that's all available in logs. So a quick overview of Prevail Drive. To, um, it's a super easy to use, but underneath all this is a lot of power in, in the encryption. Um, sorry, let me go to the next slide. Um, Prevail Mail is, think of it as an encrypted messaging system with an optional uh, email front end. You can access it through a browser or you can access it through Outlook. And when you add it to Outlook, um, it looks like this. 
you have um, your regular mailbox is not is is not touched at all. We have a an add-in that you can use that actually shows you that these messages aren't encrypted, just like the spam that you get here or this um, spoofing attack where your CEO somebody acting like your CEO wants you to wire transfer some money. But you can see there's another set of inboxes that are labeled encrypted. These actually have the same email address. They're the same email address. You don't have to tell anybody about a new email address. But anything that goes to and from this, these mailboxes are encrypted end to end. And we put up this little banner here to show you that they're encrypted end to end. And so here you can include, you know, your company financials and um, uh, real wire transfer information. But Outlook way, works the way you're used to working with. You want to create a message. Um, it, uh, it starts with where you, where you were before. We started in the regular mailbox, so it, it assumes that you don't want to encrypt the message. But once you start typing in the name of somebody, if that's a prevail person, somebody who's already on prevail, you see it are automatically converted that to an encrypted message. And if, if everybody you're addressing to are prevail members, it'll stay encrypted. If you include somebody who's not a prevail member, it assumes that you don't want to send that encrypted, so it'll turn encryption off. But you can force that any way you want. You can click that toggle switch and say, I want to turn encryption on, and it says, okay, I'm going to invite this other person to join. Because if you are going to be able to send and receive encrypted messages, you do have to have the software installed. Um, so that person will get an invitation. You should probably talk to them in advance. Uh, but in this case, uh, I'm going to remove that person from the mail message. Um, and again, you know, you use Outlook just the way you're used to using it. Uh, you address the message, you can include attachments, you can change font styles and sizes and all that kind of stuff. And uh, it's just the normal Outlook user interface to send a message. Um, there, so this is, a, this is a, you know, an optional front end for Outlook. There's also an optional front end for um, Google for G Suite. If you like the Google browser experience, again, here's the Google browser. Here's all the same, you know, regular messages and my regular mail spam, the spoofing attack and so forth. But you can see over the side, there's a secure messages folder. This is where all the end to end encrypted stuff goes, including the message we had just sent a moment ago. Uh, but again, you know, you just use the, uh, the regular browser interface of Gmail. If you send to a user that is a Prevail member, it puts an or orange stripe by them. But you can always turn encryption on or off with this little control anytime you want. So, um, so that's, a, um, that's, a, that's a, a, a brief look at Prevail Mail. One other thing I would like to uh, point out, as I said, in all these examples, um, the, uh, we, we, we've had the Prevail software installed on a computer. Um, but sometimes, uh, that's a difficult thing to do. Sometimes you may be working with somebody, an external party uh, or somebody who, um, who is not able or does not want to install software on the computer because it may be a lockdown environment. How do you deal with that? Uh, well, again, in, in Prevail, there's a notion of a key, a private key that enables all this encryption. And that can be put on your phone if you don't want to put it on your computer. And, and the phone could be used to get access. So uh, to do that, we have something we call Web Prevail. You can open any browser session. And if you go to just web.prevail.com, it asks you for email address. Normally, you put in an email and a password. Actually, Prevail doesn't have passwords. We have this key. And again, as I said, we can have the key on the phone. So we open up the phone, do our biometric auth authentication. There's a command that says log into Web Prevail. And if you do that, a QR code appears on your Windows machine. You just simply hold your camera on the phone up to that QR code. And it allows a, private, a temporary copy of your key to be transferred. And now just for the duration of this browser session, you can send and receive emails, you can access your files on Prevail Drive and so forth. Uh, and, and so that's a way to get access if you, um, if you don't want to uh, install Prevail on the computer. Let me wrap up with a security model. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Prevail uses end-to-end -end encryption. So it's encrypted on the client, it stays encrypted on the server and only gets decrypted when it gets to its destination. So again, the server is just a repository for gibberish, a repository for encrypted data. There are no passwords in Prevail because often, as we know, password attacks are one of the, uh, the, the, the most popular ways to attack uh, a user. 
And uh, because if you know a password, it's likely an attacker can probably guess it and log in remotely. Instead, there's this private key that's stored on your device. And the way that works is it's not only used for authentication, but when you read something, the server hands you the encrypted document and you use the private key locally to decrypt that and uh, access it. I was showing you how this worked. All this goes on behind the scenes when we're using Outlook and so forth. All this key management and stuff is happening behind the scenes. Um, we talked about avoiding central points of attack. And you know, admins have big privileges. And so uh, if an attacker can compromise an admin, they can do bad things too. Uh, in Prevail, there's still admins because sometimes you need an admin to investigate if a user is doing something that they might not supposed to be doing or to export data. If there's, for example, a, a, you know, a lawsuit, you have to give the messages and, and documents to lawyers. So <clears throat> admins can still do that in Prevail, but they only do it when authorized by what we call an approval group. And the way this works is um, it, it actually works cryptographically. So if we need to be able to decrypt a bunch of emails or files, um, what happens is the approvers have pieces of the keys that are necessary to do that. No approver has all the keys, but only when the approvers come together, uh, this is a math technique called threshold cryptography, only when the approvers come together can the keys be reconstructed and the information be decrypted. And of course, immediately after that, the, the keys are changed. Um, so let me wrap up uh, and, and take any questions. Um, I wanted to you know, just offer some examples of, of not only compliance, but enhanced security, balancing ease of use, and solving problems all across the supply chain. So let me pause there and see if there's... Uh, Thank you so much, Randy. We, have a, we do have a few questions. So the, the first question um, might be a kind of a controversial one, but uh, is it true that to be CMMC level three compliant, you have to go with GCC high? Uh, don't know who no. asked that question, but... Uh, <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> no, we're up, Prevail is helping lots of companies be CMMC compliant without going to GCC high. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure where that, uh, I guess the rumor came from or, or how, um, I guess a, a follow on question from that is how is Prevail and other companies spreading the message that, that, that they, do, or they are not stuck and they do not have to go with the GCC high uh, product? Well, this is, this, is, this is what we do. <laughs> we, right. uh, we, uh, this is our job. So we try and shout it from the mountaintops. Sometimes we can only get so high in the mountaintops, but we're trying to get the message across uh, as, as well as we can, uh, um, uh, you know, um, and, and, and reinforcing this. So um, uh, it's, uh, it's, our, it's our job to spread the word. And Jonathan, you've helped us do that, which we appreciate. Roger. So the second question, Randy, uh, can the Prevail tool uh, or product, can it store CUI at, at rest? So I know, I think you talked about how you can solve the CUI problem through transit and with file sharing. And, for, and so this question is, is there a way that you can store it uh, at rest, like on your, I guess, maybe on your share drive or? Um... So uh, yeah, there's, this, um... This question might be a bit nuanced, so let me, let me uh, try and be clear on it. On the server, the information is encrypted all the time, in transit, at rest, in use. So uh, if you think of the equivalent of a SharePoint drive or something like that, uh, it is encrypted all the time. It, the information files do get decrypted on a user device, like uh, on your, you know, let's say on your computer. They're decrypted at that point. And uh, you can, um, Prevail doesn't encrypt it additionally, but you know, you can use, uh, you know, Microsoft's tools or Apple's tools to encrypt on the hard drive to encrypt at rest on a user device. On the mobile device, uh, the data is, is not stored uh, locally on the mobile device. It's only retrieved when accessed. All right. Uh, the, the third question, sir, is does Prevail work on government networks? Um, I think I think what the question is referring to can uh, the government? Could you send an email to the government uh, representative and and they open it? Uh, I guess uh, from their network. Yeah, right now, uh, not at this time. Um, 
Um, but we're working on a, on a gateway that we'll hopefully have out, you know, uh, sooner rather than later that can enable that. Okay. Uh, let's see, last question, sir. For a small, it says for a small business, uh, what is the average cost for Prevail's, uh, I guess, Prevail's CUI solution? Yeah, it's, it's basically uh, about 30 bucks per user per month. Uh, and you, with that, you get all the features, unlimited storage, mail and files. All right, that's very straightforward. Uh, and then, uh, you know, my last, I guess, my question I have with you, Randy, is um, like, what advice would you give uh, any kind of uh, defense industrial-based company who is looking to, you know, get into the market from a GovCon perspective? Uh, what, what advice would you give them uh, what, on the CMMC, I guess, uh, implementation perspective? And um, what kind of lessons learned have you seen? I know you've talked to a lot of small businesses uh, since Prevails started marketing to the GovCon sector with their tool. And what are some of the things that, uh, that you've seen and maybe some advice that you could give uh, both the audience here and our, um, our people who are dialed in on the on web, uh, some advice? Sure, sure, appreciate that. Um, uh, one, it, you know, it's, it's always good to get ahead of the game um, because these kind of compliance things, you know, don't tend to go away. <laughs> they tend to, uh, they, they, they tend to uh, exist. And, and uh, so better to get started than, than to wait, um, number one. Uh, number two, um, I would say, you know, it, it definitely in, investigate alternative solutions um, because there is a, a lot of dogma that goes around, you know, uh, that uh, like you have to convert your entire organization. You may not need to do that, as I mentioned in the Enclave uh, case. You know, there are options that can, that can make it a whole lot easier. And third, um, you know, almost everybody we work with is working with uh, uh, an organization like yours, Jonathan, to help them through the process. That, uh, that can be, uh, you know, an, another set of eyes and ears, help with the documentation, help with the, the follow through, and that, that's invaluable in, uh, in getting through the uh, compliance knothole. Well, Andy, we really appreciate your time, appreciate your brief, and uh, we look forward to seeing what Prevail has in the future for the defense industrial base, sir.